Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com, and uh, what I'm going to do here is share with you a presentation I did uh, uh, about a week ago um, at a, a local gardening club here, the Bedford Horticultural Society. I was supposed to film it when I was there, but the uh, lighting was, wasn't right, and there was a few other complications, and uh, it didn't pan out. So, but I, you know, I put the whole presentation together, and I thought, well, my, my viewers might want to, uh, you know, enjoy it, uh, engage in this way. So. Um, what I'm going to do is just go through the PowerPoint presentation and sort of talk through. It's going to be like kind of like a podcast, I guess, but you can see the visual aids as well. So the the topic they wanted me to talk about was direct seeding, uh, as opposed to doing transplants. Direct seeding in a northern garden was the title. Why I don't bother with transplants. So talking about for those that follow my channel all the time, uh, you notice that I don't um, start transplants indoors. A lot of people start doing that this time of year or or very soon. Uh, I don't bother doing that for a number of reasons and uh, I still have success despite having a, a fairly short uh, growing season here. I mean it's zone 6A where I live but that's not the whole story. That just tells you, as I've said many times, how cold it gets in the winter. It doesn't tell you what kind of growing season you have. Your growing season is that time between the first, uh, the last frost in the spring and the first frost in the fall. Really a lot of things just uh, you know, it becomes very difficult. Uh, you, and here where I live, uh, last year was a good example. We had frost uh, in late June, hard, like freezes in late June. And we got our first frost, I can't remember, in the uh, early October or something like that. So a relatively short season for those that have uh, uh, longer seasons. Than, uh, now, a frost in late June is, is not typical of here. We will often have frost in uh, late May. Uh, late June was... Uh, a very, very, you know, we might have frost late May, early June. Certainly not uh, late June, it was rare, but anyway, it can happen. So, um, that was the topic. So, uh, the first part is a bit of an overview. I just talk about who I am. This might be useful for people that are new to the channel. Uh, if you've been watching me all along, this uh, first part is going to be a bit uh, uh, stuff you already know, but maybe there's something you don't. Uh, talk about my garden a little bit, and then I'm going to talk about the whole transplanting thing and why I don't bother doing it and what I do instead. Um, so, uh, uh, who am I? I? I'm not a, for those that don't know, I don't have any credential as a master gardener. I'm just a guy that grows a lot of uh, his own food in his backyard. I have an eight-hour day work day. I've got a two-hour commute. i got a wife and two kids and a house and all those uh, obligations. Um, and despite all of that, I keep a large 2,500-square-foot uh, garden. And uh, by my estimate, I grow at least about $2,000 worth of produce in that garden a year. So it's, it's uh, definitely worth its weight uh, in terms of the certainly get more value out than what I put in in terms of money and in terms of time I just consider every minute I spend in that garden a combination of therapy, meditation and exercise which a lot of people pay for that um, so that costs me nothing and I get food as a return so there's really no downside to having a garden. Um, how do I garden? I practice uh, no-till no -till approach to gardening. Uh, the more technical term is permaculture but I think no-till is a little bit more descriptive um, I, you copy natural systems that exist in nature. You go in the forest, no one's watering that, no one's weeding that, no one's fertilizing that. Uh, so you, you find ways to copy the way that, that successful system works in your own garden. Uh, you use sustainable inputs and practices. You, you, know, you basically leave the world uh, no better, you know, n no worse than the way you found it, ideally better. And uh, you know, as a general principle, be kind to the other organisms. Uh, and the planet. I mean, if you, if you read up on, for those that are, are more expert on the concept of permaculture, there's, you know, three tenets and twelve principles and da 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 da, da. It gets very complicated. There's, there's no brief way to gloss over all of that. But I think those three points really do summarize what it's about. Copy natural system, use sustainable inputs and practices, and be kind to the other things, uh, that share the planet with you and the planet itself. Um, so, um, uh, a result of that is that you don't have to bother tilling, you don't fertilize, and there's minimal water and weeding involved in your garden. Um, most years, from some point in July until the for the remainder of the growing season, I really don't water my garden at all. Maybe the odd time, but it's not a regular. It ceases to be a regular thing. It's an extraordinarily rare thing that I need my watering hose um, from about the middle of July onwards. Uh, which, by the way, is the hottest in the middle of July and August is the hottest part of our year. It's the driest part of our year. And that's when I don't bother watering at all. And that's just a beautiful 
uh, magic of using a permacultural approach, the, the permaculture approach, the no-till approach. Um, the busiest, my busiest time of year in the garden, people always think of gardening as a lot of work. My busiest time of year is late summer and fall. Not because I'm gardening, it's because I'm collecting food. I've got so much food coming out of my garden. Um, it's all I can do to keep up with it and to find different ways to preserve, store it, and so on and so forth so that I can continue to eat food out of my garden uh, well into the winter. I did a video a few uh, weeks ago where I was showing everything that I still had that I'm still eating out of my garden. I, I, I try to get as much value out of that as possible. You, you, you know, you bought the land, you own the land, you pay the property taxes, the land should give you some food in return. So that, that's my general approach to that. Um, I did a little thing on why I started. I don't think I've ever really talked about this on my uh, podcast or my YouTube channel. Certainly not the YouTube channel. Um, why do I? Why do I have a YouTube channel? Why do I have a podcast? And, and the reason is that I got into the the whole no to uh, no till approach. Uh, I became aware of it in 2010, 2011 sort of thing, and uh, I found very little information on the topic that spoke specifically to what I was doing. Uh, that is to say. Uh, just being a back, you know, I wasn't trying to like go off grid and have chickens and goats and, you know, some huge commune type thing, which a lot of the permaculture uh, discourse tends to come from that point of view. I'm just a guy with a house in a backyard, but I was, I was intrigued by the general approach, the simplicity of it, the cheapness of it, the sustainability of it, the ecological, uh, sustainability of it, that sort of thing. There was a, and it just seemed to make a lot of sense, right? It, it seemed to be very logical to me. I'm a person who uh, really values uh, logic and rationality. It seemed like an extremely logical way to coax food to grow out of your soil. Um, and I just didn't see anything coming at it from my angle. So I just started just to start my own channel. And, and, you know, there was some, there are some uh, channels out there that are uh, in the same vein, but they weren't specific to my microclimate. And I figured, well, geez, there must be other people with uh, lousy growing seasons with too much fog and too much cold and not enough warm and the soil's no good and all that sort of stuff. There must be other people in similar parts of the world that are like that. And it's very possible they're intrigued by permaculture. and Maybe they're trying to make it work and it's not working. And, and they're working through that trial and error process and they want to learn about it. I think there's like Jeff Lawton does a video uh, called uh, Northern Gardening. And he's... It's gardening in New Zealand, uh, and uh, <laughs> he's growing like you know bananas and things like that. It's like that's uh, I'm, I'm over. I'm uh, it's maybe not bananas, but he's growing things in New Zealand that will not grow here. So his concept of north. I mean, uh, uh, Jeff Watton's fantastic, and I love all of his stuff. But he, <laughs> what he's calling a northern garden, or uh, uh, he might not use the word northern because New Zealand's in the south, but. He's basically uh, what he's talking about is uh, <laughs> it's not the same as the things they're getting to grow are not things that will grow here. Period. <laughs> it's just too cold here for those things. Um, anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, so I started with the podcast first, and then I started doing YouTube videos. Uh, and the general angle I'm coming for, coming from is I'm trying to provide uh, practical and pragmatic advice for backyard gardeners who want to grow as much of their own organic food as possible in the cheapest, easiest, and most sustainable way possible. I, I don't think I can succinctly summarize what my content's about more than that. That's, that's where I'm coming from, right? And it's, of course, aimed at the backyard gardener. I mean, you know, if you've got a community garden or a plot or some sort of allotment or whatever, wherever you are, everything applies. It's just the scale I'm doing this on, this is my garden. Um, it's not the whole thing, but it's, uh, I would say, 85% um, of the area that I have cultivated on my property that's producing food. That's it. Um, so... You know, if you live in an apartment building and you have a, a plot or two in some community garden, everything I'm doing here applies to that. I'm just, I'm, I'm on a scale, right? <laughs> that goes beyond that. Um, so, you know, uh, some of the things I do may not, I mean, there's lots of, I, I, I use uh, slug bait in my garden for at a certain time of the year. And if you only have a, a plot or two, you can just pick the slugs off. But when you've got this much space and this much going on, it, um, it gets a bit, uh, 
difficult <laughs> to, to go around picking slugs. Uh, though I'm sure there's people that do it, but maybe they don't have a 10 hour work day. All right. Um, you know, this is, I'm just going through a couple pictures of my garden. You know, like this was from a, maybe a couple seasons ago, but I mean, every season it basically looks something like this, but I'm perpetually rotating my crops and that sort of thing, moving things around. Um, but all summer long, um, every morning when I walk into my garden, this is how I start my day. I love to go out in the morning with a, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and just walk around and have a look at things and see what's going on inspect uh, the garden sort of thing maybe spend five or ten minutes doing that um, not every day but you know maybe a few days a week that's a wonderful thing to do in the morning with the, the birds singing and all those morning dawn sounds and so on so this is what I see when I enter my garden a um, couple of examples of different I like to have uh, walking paths and borders in my garden um, it's, it's an aesthetic sort of thing but also there's advantages of it because you there's just a certain place you can walk and a certain place you can't walk. I never walk in the beds, right? And uh, it helps to manage the space. Uh, in these gardens here, I've got them bordered with rocks. There's a lot I like about rocks because they can they can capture heat from the sun. They can thaw out the soil. Um, great for growing. If you've got a rock bordered garden, growing potatoes and things like that, the roots and the potatoes love growing right next to the rocks. Uh, I think there's like that, that soil is always moist. It's always moist. You know, when you're a kid and you go look for worms and salamanders and stuff like that, you tip a rock over, no matter how dry it is, the soil underneath the rock is wet. And the plants like it for that reason, right? There's always a bit of it. Because you think about it, a, a rock is basically a kind of mulch. It doesn't provide any organic matter, but it does provide a lot of uh, mineral uh, mineral elements. And it also doesn't, the rocks do an incredible job of keeping the soil from heating up. So they're a great thing to border a garden. Um, just a cucumber garden on the left and on the right the zucchini um, and another shot from above um, and uh, the thing about my garden is is that everything always has a mulch every bit every space everywhere anything is growing the soil is never bare there's always something uh, on the soil it could be leaves it could be straw it could be hay it could be seaweed it could be cardboard it could be just about um, anything that's organic that will break down, that the soil organisms will eat, and in turn turn that uh, matter into uh, various elements that benefit the soil and benefit the plants growing in it. I think these are beans here. And to the left, I think that's uh, <laughs> could be another bean garden to the left from the list of things. Maybe potatoes. Actually, I think it's potatoes to the left. That's a potato garden to the left and beans in front of it. Um, this one is a, this would be a cucumber garden from last spring. This would have been the way my cucumbers looked in early July. That's, that's, you know, they had survived the, the frost. And, and this uh, mulch here where I had the cucumbers, you see how you make a little circle and you put the seed in and uh, let the plant come up. Um, that mulch was probably four inches thick. Um, and the, again, the advantage of having the mulch is it feeds the organisms in the soil and as well it keeps the, the moisture levels in the soil constant. Um, so because this episode is about transplants and I'm talking about why I don't don't do transplants, I think it makes sense to begin with a bit of a spiel about why people grow transplants. I got no problem with people that do that. It's not like I there are some tribes that I want to destroy or anything like that. Uh, right? it's just, I just don't do it. Because you'll see why I don't do it. But if you do, if you love getting transplants growing in your house. You enjoy. It, okay. So, and if I've missed anything, please uh, list something in the comment section. But I mean, the reasons people like to grow transplants: they get an early start to their growing season. Uh, potentially, you can increase the yield because. The plant hits the ground running when you move it outside because it's already been growing since since March or April sort of thing. Uh, it can really help with certain heat-loving vegetables, you know, tomatoes and peppers and things like that because they really can't be planted out until after the last possible frost date. Um, and if you have a short growing season, that, that greatly uh, shortens the, the amount of time the plant's outside. So it's uh, beneficial instead of trying to direct seed it to... Uh, get it going inside either in a, in a nice sunny window or under artificial lights. Um, another reason people grow transplants is especially if you're an avid gardener, it's just nice to do some kind of gardening in the dead of winter. It breaks your winter doldrums. Everybody starts, you know, especially this time of year, a lot of people have already bought their seeds. I, I have to say, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I 
even though I've done a number, I did two videos on choosing seeds and how to go about choosing them. I still have not ordered my seeds. I keep going over the list and changing things. Not much, but I keep every time I look at this list, I change my mind about something, and I reserve the right to do that. One that's one advantage of not doing transplants. You can keep changing your mind for quite a while. Um, <laughs> there's no planting going on outside right now. Like, everything is super cold right now. It's frigid. I think it was minus 29 with the wind chill a couple days ago. And it's just frigid and really windy and cold and and just. Uh, no, I'm just not feeling. I'm not feeling it right now. <laughs> so a great thing about uh, growing transplants indoors is that you can get that feeling of having some soil and getting a seed and getting it growing. And, and you know we're we're all jonesing pretty hard for that this time of year. Also, everybody does it. It's you know there's something people talk about. You go to a garden center. It's transplants, transplants, transplants. They're selling transplant equipment. They're selling selling the heaters you put underneath it. All the different lights and the different light spectrums and little fans and this soil and that soil and this mix and that mix and this spray that prevents the mildew and all that sort of there's a whole whole industry around it right so it's just something that's going on and also it can give you results right anyone that's the, the child of a gardening parent uh, has memories of their parents getting transplants started before growing season I certainly remember uh, transplants being in the bow window of my living room uh, every year getting a head start on the garden uh, now why I hate growing transplants. <laughs> Hate's a strong. I chose the word hate to be provocative. Really, it's I would say why I can't stand growing transplants to be more accurate. Um, number one, I've got better things to do in March. <laughs> I just, just can't, I don't want to mess or frig around with transplants in March. Uh, you know, it, it's for me. Uh, you know, during garden season, I garden. When it's not garden season, there's other things I like to do. I love being outdoors. I like hiking. I like being in the woods. I find March is a great season to scout out places to uh, go trout fishing because there's no mosquitoes and, and the going's pretty easy because the ground's frozen and uh, if you're really lucky you can, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you got snow, if there's a good deep snow, we don't have deep snow right now, but you can cover a lot of ground fairly easily if there's a good deep snow and you got snowshoes, but anyway, it's off topic. Um, I find growing transplants extremely labor intensive. I mean, they, they don't fend for themselves, right? You have to water them. You have to monitor them. Is all you know. This is little tiny plants growing in little tiny cups of soil. They don't retain any water. You're always having to mess around with the water. Um, there's all these different systems you have to use to buy all this gear. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be people saying, oh, "I do it, and it's easy as pie." I think you find it easy, but I find it a real drag. Uh, <laughs> you find it easy, do it. Enjoy. I. <laughs> It's not like I tried it once and didn't like it. I've tried growing transplants for years. I always found it to be a chore, uh, as opposed to out in my garden where I put seeds in the ground and they grow, and they they grow the way things grow in nature. They just sort of take care of themselves for the most part, right? Uh, nothing in a transplant environment, in my experience, takes care of itself uh, without assistance, without you know equipment, and so on and so forth. I don't want to run lights. Uh, where I live, I do not have a, a window that has natural light that's ideal for doing this. Uh, there's one south-facing window in our house. It's not a big window, and it's just, where it is, it's just not the place to have transplants. Mrs. Maritime Garden is not okay with me <laughs> setting up a transplant operation there. Um, and just the way it's positioned, even though it's south-facing, it, it doesn't seem to um, do the grading. You got to turn them around and you, oh, all this stuff. I, I find it a pain. Um, also, the hardening off process for transplants. Uh, for someone who's basically not in the house 10 hours a day, um, it's extremely, uh, I find it aggravating. You take it out for two hours this day and three hours that day and you put it on the north side of the house and the west side. I, I've tried every possible thing, you know, and there's always seasons where I take everything out and I come home from work and I have a glass of wine with dinner and I take a nap on the couch and I go to bed and I leave them out all night and they all die. <laughs> it was cold that night. Um, and everything I was doing from March on was just lost in one night because I had one glass of wine or something like that. So yeah, it's uh, this whole hardening off thing is uh, very difficult, especially if you if you start them under um, artificial lights. It's that much more challenging to harden them off because the natural light is just so much more uh, intense and damaging. The plants have a lot of adapting to do. And it's not to say it can't be done. It's just not easy. It's not like you just I, I never found some really dead easy idiot proof way to harden plants off. It's always tedious, 
careful and requires attention. Um, so it's just the way I organize my life. It, it just doesn't work for me. Um, and, and also, it's it's kind of in, inconsistent with with permaculture, right? I mean, the way things work in nature is a seed falls to the ground, stays there all winter, and then a plant grows the next year. And you know, if you're running a permaculture garden, you you kind of copy that. You, you can't put every seed in the ground in the fall. Um, but it's it's ideal to just put a seed in the ground and let the sun warm that ground and that thing come up, right? I like that as opposed to having all this equipment and technology in my house and having to frig around with artificial lights and timers and all this stuff. It just doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, also, I would say in my experience, it's really, you know, with the exception of maybe peppers, um, it's a marginal return. Uh, you know, the way I do things, I get plenty of tomatoes. I'm swimming in tomatoes. Um, maybe I, if I did transplants, I'd get tomatoes a few weeks earlier, um, and maybe I'd get my peppers a few weeks earlier. Um, but uh, it's not a huge difference. It's not like I get four times as much, or three times as much, or even twice as much. I just get a little bit more. So for me, it's for me where I am, um, it's not worth it. Um, so what do I do instead? Um, I direct seed everything, uh, everything possible. Uh, I create improvised, I'm going to show you some pictures and examples of this, I create improvised microclimates, you know, domes, hoop houses, cold frames, you watch all my videos, even different sort of things I use, really simple, just pieces of plastic stapled onto a couple little pieces of wood. There's a, a broad range of ways you can improvise a microclimate uh, in your garden, and basically anywhere where the light gets through and there's air trapped between the, between the there's air trapped above the soil in some way where light can get through that trapped area, that air trapped area, right? That's an uh, improvised microclimate because it will be warmer in that little thing than anywhere else. Um, trap air and let the light through. Um, you got to plant things in the right order. There's certain things you plant early. There's certain things you plant late. I mean, uh, generally speaking, as a, as a rule of thumb, using the approach I use, whatever you plant, Plant at a given time, you can plant it about a month earlier, give or take, right? <laughs> but there's also things that I, and I don't, I don't use these domes and hoop houses and cold frames for growing everything. There's certain things that can wait, like um, parsnips and so on. I'll talk about that more as we go along here. Um, know what conditions your plants need. Know what's tough and what's fragile. Some things are just a lot tougher than others. Spinach is tougher than kale, for instance. Um, you get a hard frost, uh, the kale might lose a few leaves, and the spinach will be fine. Right, so you got to know those qualities of those certain vegetables, and I don't know the qualities of every vegetable, but um, you, you do a bit of trial and error, and you, you make notes, and you, you adapt every season based on what you've learned. And choose your varieties carefully. You want to choose fast-growing varieties to the best of your ability. My sponsor, Vessi Seeds, uh, kind of specializes in seeking out varieties that seem to do really well with short growing seasons. Um, and uh, Plan B is to uh, if thing, everything goes wrong, <laughs> let's see, and last year was a good example. I had tomatoes growing under glass. I planted them in the middle of May. They were growing fine. Same with peppers. I had peppers and tomatoes direct seeded. Uh, I think the, the tomatoes I planted in the middle of May and the peppers I planted in late May and everything had germinated. Everything was growing. And then we had frost the second or third week of, of, of June and everything just disappeared, even under glass. It all died out in one night. Um, and that happens sometimes. I mean, if you're, it was an incredibly cold uh, late June frost. Uh, and when it happens, you just buy transplants <laughs> or replant. Uh, for instance, when all that happened, I had, I think, uh, June 1st or the first or second week of June, I had, I had a whole bunch of things, tomatoes die. And I just bought some cheap dollar store tomato seeds and plants, uh, planted them in the ground, you know, in June. And, uh, you know, by August, I had, or August, September sort of thing, I had lots of tomatoes coming off of those plants, even though it was late. And I'll talk about why about that as we move on.
All right, so here we have some examples of uh, improvised cold frames. And if you go and look at my videos from around this time of year last year, last, you know, February 2018, March 2018, you can see the progression of, of things I started this way. I, I haven't begun uh, this sort of thing this year, except for like two experiments I've got going in my garden. I might talk about that later. But um, uh, last February, uh, this was the first cold frame I made, and I planted a variety of spinach called uh, Sardinia, I think, here. Um, so, and this was just an improvised cold frame. It was just a couple windows that someone had thrown away. And I put a couple pieces of wood uh, at the back and one piece of wood at the front. So there's a bit of a slope. You can see, uh, you know, uh, back, back here, there's two, two or three, uh, uh, four by fours. And there's just one four by four here. So it was a slope, right? This is the high end. This is the low end. And south is where I'm standing. So it's sloped facing south. And uh, this would have been the last week of February that the soil, I, I, I rigged this up a couple weeks before that and the soil thawed out and we had good, and it's certainly a different kind of year than the one we're having right now. I, I really don't think there's much. Uh, it's been so unbelievably cold and lousy. Uh, I haven't even thought to go out and see what's going on in my garden. That's how loud, I'm just not feeling it right now. Maybe first, I'd like to see four days of sun in a row. <laughs> And then I'll get excited. <laughs> it has not happened yet. Uh, so when I see about four days of sun, uh, that's when I'll get that itch to start uh, sowing seeds. Uh, I just don't think, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll go have a look tomorrow uh, and see what's going on. We'll see what, what's happening. Anyway, uh, I planted uh, spinach in this and it, and it worked out really well. Got a great head start, way ahead of schedule. Uh, another good trick is uh, what I call the plastic square. It's just a rectangle of wood frame like a window sort of thing. Um, these were uh, one by threes and you staple plastic onto it the last multiple years. And well, they're not particularly great for growing things under, but they're really good for creating a microclimate that will thaw out your soil, right? You can't get anything to germinate until the soil is, uh, I mean, you can't plant anything until, you know, a lot of seed packs will say plant as early as the soil can be worked. Well, um, <laughs> It can't be worked if it's frozen, <laughs> right? And uh, even if the soil can be worked, is it like uh, on any given day is the temperature of the soil two degrees Celsius? I mean, most plants won't even germinate. So, you know, like the, even the toughest, coldest, most hardy plants won't germinate until it's like maybe five degrees Celsius. There are some things that will germinate at 15 degrees Celsius and some things that will germinate at 15 degrees. Most of your heat-loving things uh, need it to be like 15 or 16 degrees Celsius, you know, approaching... Uh, the, 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 the bare edge of room temperature. Room temperature, for those that do, don't do Celsius, is 20. Um, if you're in a house and it's 15, uh, you probably want a hoodie on or a sweater or something like that. Um, if it's 20, you could, you know, if you're a person that's always warm, you could wear a t-shirt, um, and pants. You probably wouldn't wear shorts unless you're an extremely warm person. Um, just to give you a sense of what those temperatures mean for, for people that don't go by, uh, metric or by Celsius. Anyway, these uh, plastic squares are really good for getting your soil warm, right? Getting, uh, not just thawing them up, but warming them up, right? Because you, you, don't, you don't want, these, the plastic squares are really easy to store. They don't take up a lot of room. Whereas these domes, as you can see on the right over, over here, take up a lot of space. So, you know, you might have something growing underneath this, and then you have a plan to grow something here. So while that thing's getting started, you're warming up the soil here, getting it ready, right? Um, so that's one huge advantage of the plastic square. And I, I basically put all this stuff on. I put it all out in, in December sort of thing, uh, you know, just to keep the soil as warm as possible all winter long. Why not give the worms um, everything they need? Uh, why not extend the amount? I mean, I'm not extending my growing season very much because it, it's getting really cold at night. But hopefully I'm extending my worm and soil organism activity season. Right, because they're the ones that are moving around in the soil, making little tunnels, uh, eating the rotting leaves, pooping, and, and basically uh, creating the conditions for an awesome garden the following year. Why not extend? If I can't extend my growing season, at least I can extend my my mulching, composting, fertilizing season, right? Um, and of course, this is the hoop toast. I just did a video on how to make these. I've, I've got about four or five of these in my garden, and that's about all I, I really care to. Uh, I mean, even I've got plenty more than four or five beds, but 
I think that's really all you need. You don't need to jumpstart everything. There's certain things I want right away, and there's certain things that is just, just, just temperamental. If you want to start them a week or two early, if you want to take that risk, uh, you could lose them if you have one cold night, so it's nice to having this. And also, uh, even when, um, like for instance, if you're planting a heat-loving thing on uh, the 1st of July or uh, mid-June or whatever, where I live, because it's overcast so often, um, having these things uh, over those plants just creates that little extra heat. You're cheating. The, where I live, it's just not warm, and by having that on, the plant thinks it's, it's somewhere a little bit nicer, and it grows a little faster. Um, so uh, th that's the great thing. And the great thing about the hoop out, as opposed to the cold frame, is that you can move them from garden to garden, from year to year, so they accommodate your crop rotation. Right? The cold frames do not. There are certain things I would, you know, I, so a given year I might, the garden where this hoop is, maybe next year I'll grow carrots here. I'm not going to use a hoop house or I wouldn't, I would never grow carrots in a cold frame. I mean, cold frames for me are like greenhouses. They're for growing hot things. Um, so the great thing about using the hoop house is that a, a given bed can grow a heat loving thing one year and then the next year it can grow something where you don't need any sort of hoop at all. So it, it really accommodates crop rotation and moving things around. And they're really cheap, way cheaper, because, you know, your bed's one thing, the hoop's another thing. So it's, it's you know, these hoop houses I use with wire mesh, they might cost 20 bucks to slap together, and they'll last maybe five years, maybe more, depending on how heavy the plastic is. And so on. the plastic I use on these is uh, what they call 6 mil poly. If you go to any hardware store and say, give me some 6 mil poly, they'll know what you're talking about. They'll give it to you in a big roll. So it's a really handy uh, way to do it. And I've got videos on that if you're interested. Uh, and of course, there's the cold frames. Um, so I mean, they're useful and they're they're well built and they're solid and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of advantages to cold frames, but one of the things about them is that they're not really conducive. It would seem ridiculous to me to grow uh, all my other beds at any given year. They might have something like a potato in them. They might have a root veg. They might have a squash. They might have some other thing. Uh, I would never grow squash in a cold frame because those cold frames are about two and a half feet by six feet wide. Uh, maybe I could grow two squash in one of those. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> As opposed to having them grow in one of my beds and just putting a cloche or some sort of uh, little piece of plastic over the seed when it's getting started. Um, but just because they need so much space, right? It, yeah, and sure, I could train them up my fence and all that sort of stuff, but then really you don't have cold frames for growing things like squash. And you, I wouldn't think to grow beans in a cold frame because i got so much other area. There's places where it makes more sense to grow beans. So all those things that uh, can be good, you know, growing beans or any kind of legume in a soil from, uh, in, 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 from time to time is good for the soil, but uh, those cold frames are never going to have beans in them. I mean, basically, I'm losing the advantage of the cold frame. In the cold frame, I like to grow things like peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, Right, real. And, you know, the cold frames are the are the greenhouses of my garden. I, I don't have these, uh, so I can grow and eat kale out of my garden in January. I did an entire experiment this year and showed you what a colossal. Where I live, I'm not saying other people can't pull this off, but what I live, where I live, given how overcast it is in the winter, we just don't get any sun. Um, so the cold frames don't, I don't care how you design your cold frame, if there's no sun shining on it, it's not going to warm up. What are you going to put, like an oil heater in there or something like that? If there's no sun, the cold frame doesn't get hot. And I, you know, I, I had some suggestions this year on how to uh, enhance the cold frame. So, of course, I'll do the experiment again next year with all of those suggestions incorporated into the design as well. Um, but I'm not overly optimistic. And if you followed my updates on the cold frames this year, I don't think you would be um, either. But that's <laughs> enough on that. I still think they have a place in their garden and they're useful, but um, they're, they're much more useful for people that get good sun in the winter. Uh, I don't think it really has much to do with your zone either. It's more about um, your proximity to weather systems that make it overcast and foggy and rainy and cloudy and that sort of thing. The sun's just not getting through. Um, enough on that. Uh, there's just another view of my, this picture was probably taken three weeks ago. This is the picture I used for that seed plant if you haven't seen that video. Um, so that's, you know, I think there's one more, um, there's a piece of plastic here. I use that, that cold frame I built just a few days ago. 
I uh, used this piece of plastic that was just blown around the garden all winter long. Um, so that's uh, kind of how things look right now. It's not the again not the entire garden, but a good portion of it. Um, so generally speaking, I'm speaking to general principles here. I'm not going to talk about how to grow this thing or that thing or specifics. I mean um, that that's probably useful for another for another video, but it's 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 incredibly tedious getting into this variety or that variety or this plant or that variety. I'm going to talk in terms of general principles because you can. Uh, and, you know, if, if you've been growing enough, you can you can apply that general principles, general categories, apply it to your garden. Um, when you create the microclimate, it, depending on how well it's designed, and of course how much sun you have where you are, it buys you one month about one month of time. It might buy you a little bit more, it might be buy you a little bit less. Whatever you were going to do in April, you might be able to do that in March. If you were going to do something in March, you might be able to do it in April. If you're going to do something in May, you might be able to, you know, and so on and so forth, right? Um, Things will germinate a month ahead of time outdoors if you direct seed outdoors, if you have some sort of uh, microclimate built over the soil where that seed has been sown, relative to how effective that microclimate is and how much sun you're getting to affect the microclimate. Um, and that's the next point. It may buy it more depending on the year and the location. Some years are better than others. It's all about the sun. It's all about the light and the heat and, and what's what's going on up in the sky above your garden. If you get the if you can get the light, then you can get the heat and things can happen. Um, also, I, I don't waste effort with certain plants. I don't bother trying to jumpstart parsnips under plastic. I mean, you don't eat those till December. I'm sure I could get a little bit bigger parsnips if I did it, but again, I'd have to build even more. Um, domes. You know, I only have so much space to store these things, right? So, <laughs> um, also, I mean, I find about four or five domes is about all I can keep up with. When the plants are under the dome, you have to do the watering. The rain does not water your plants. I hate watering my plants. Um, so, I mean, there's a certain number of domes I want in my garden, and beyond that, I don't want anymore because I don't enjoy going out. I mean, there's people I know that enjoy watering their garden. I hate it. So <laughs> I don't, just don't want to work out there. I, I love being in my garden, but there's certain things, chore-like things, that I just don't enjoy. I find water in the garden very chorish. Um, also, uh, <laughs> certain times of my year in my garden, the flies are unbelievable. And uh, lots of kind viewers have given me um, all kinds of ideas for ways to deal with the flies. Uh, I have to say, um, with all due respect, none of them work. <laughs> in this environment, it's just unbelievably bad. Uh, so the, the 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 trick is to just not be out there when the flies are bad. There's certain times of the day when they're not bad. That's when you want to be out in the garden. I do a lot of gardening at like five, six a.m. before the flies show up because uh, it's safe. <laughs> There's a certain time of the day um, when the flies uh, are the are the kings. <laughs> they're the the king of the jungle sort of thing. And I just let them uh, do their thing. And I stay out of their territory. Uh, <laughs> I let them run the space. Um, anyway, <laughs> and of course, I like to choose as many fast-growing varieties. And I'm looking at two different kinds of plant. And one matures in 80 days, and the other one matures in 70 days. I'm inclined to try the 70 day. I mean, if if the 70 day one doesn't give a good flavor, of course, right? But I mean, uh, for me, the, the the most important thing is flavor. If it tastes good, I want it. Um, and the very next thing is how fast does that thing grow? Some things just require shorter growing seasons than others, and they're always developing new varieties that have those qualities, and I tend to gravitate towards them. Why it works, that's a whole nother thing. So, number one, all plants hate being moved. You gotta think their, their roots is, is kinda like their digestive system in a sense. Uh, what happens when your digestive system, if you have like ma a major medical procedure, an operation on your digestive system, uh, what happens to you? You lose an incredible amount of weight. I, I've only ever had surgery, major surgery once in my life. It was on my esophagus and I lost like 30 pounds in a month, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, when you move a plant, you take the roots from one uh, environment and you move them to another another environment that that dramatically upsets the root system of the plant and uh, the plants don't like it some are more some plants are more tolerant uh, than others for that but they all uh, in varying degrees hate that 
Uh, every change in the growing environment causes setbacks and especially going from indoors to outdoors is a massive change. Think about the environment your plants are growing in when they're indoors, um, especially if they're growing under, under artificial light. But let's just take indoors. Uh, let's just assume you've got the best conditions possible. You're indoors, but you're in a, a window. Uh, south, the southern exposure, getting natural light, light from the sun. Even then, uh, the plant, the soil is consistent. Everything is consistent. The temperature, it's, it's room temperature. Or if there's a variation in temperature, maybe it's like, uh, you know, 20 or 21 degrees Celsius during the day, 18, 19 degrees at night. Uh, you know, right, you know, it's very close to room temperature all day long with a two or three degree change throughout the day. Um, and the soil is at room temperature as well when the plant's indoors. And if you uh, couple that with uh, artificial light, not real light, I mean, you can get plants to grow really well under different kinds of fluorescent or LED lights, but this just not the same thing. It doesn't have the same kind of intensity as the sun. So getting that plant to go from that artificial light environment to the real light environment is a pretty dramatic thing. And the same thing, even if it's in a window and it's getting pretty direct sun, it's just not the same thing as being outside. And then there's still all those variations of getting super cold at night. I mean, in the spring, when you plant things out, it's getting in the single digits at night and then getting in the double digits during the day. And you've got wind and you've got rain and you've got all these extremes and you've got the soil. Think about the soil that your plants are growing in when they're indoors. It's just a sort of fake stuff. It's not even really that real in terms of uh, an environment, right? You put the plants outside in actual soil, real soil. There's all the fungi and bacteria and different living things in there and uh, extremes. And if it rains, the soil gets super wet. It's just a different range of extremes when the when the plant's actually in the real ground. So there's a lot of adaptation the plant has to go through to get used to uh, existing in that environment. And, uh, you know, a lot of transplants, they just don't do anything for a week or two when they're adapting to that, while they're adapting to that. So, I mean, in general, uh, what I'm trying to say is the indoors environment is extremely consistent environment, whereas the outdoors environment is an extraordinarily variable environment. And when you take a transplant from the one to the other, it, it sets that thing back. So that's why direct seeding has such a huge advantage, even though you don't have the benefit of that jump start where the plants, you know, it's, it's in, inside your house, it's sort of like uh, July all year long, <laughs> or, or May, or, or June, you know, depending on where you live, but it's just sort of ideal temperature all day, all day, all year long indoors. Um, when you take it to outside, uh, it's got some adaptation to do. So I find that the time lost from not growing indoors is compensated by the growth rate of the happy plants that are direct seeded when they're outdoors. Uh, I've also found that when you've got direct seeded plants, I've done these comparisons. I've direct seeded plants and had them outside of my garden. Then I've bought transplants and stuck them in the ground uh, in the same bed. There was a, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, if you go back and look at my videos, I did an example like this with tomatoes where I had little tomatoes maybe two three inches high that I direct seeded outside under plastic and then I bought some transplant tomatoes I mean they were a slightly different variety but um, the transplants were maybe uh, a foot high something like that and uh, so I put the transplants in the same bed so they're getting the same kind of light they're dealing with the same kind of soil same kind of conditions put them in the same bed as the bed with the short three inch direct seeded tomatoes but the direct seeded tomatoes were plants that had not been moved. And within a few weeks, the transplants hadn't grown at all. I mean, they were still alive and they were doing okay, but they hadn't really grown much. And the direct seeded tomatoes had actually caught up. And over the course of the growing season, the direct seeded ones did much better. Um, just because the, the root system was just so much happier and had never been stunted in any sort of way. Uh, also, when you do this sort of thing, especially if you're starting them under plastic a bit early, like in March, uh, if you can do that, if you've got enough sun to heat up the ground and thaw it out and get things to germinate, 
you get a huge head start on pests because I'm, I'm not exactly sure why because the the worms become active uh, in March if you can warm the soil up with a dome or a hoop house or a cold frame or something like that but uh, for whatever reason snails and slugs don't seem to show up so you get a and also the um, the uh, what are they called uh, um, flea beetles they do not show up so like in March sort of thing right so you're growing things like kale that I find tend to get attacked by a lot of stuff uh, they don't seem to get bothered by anything when they're growing in March so they get a bit of a head start and of course when the seed starts in real soil uh, the plants not shocked by being tra uh, transplanted into real living soil right uh, when you take a plant from your house and put it in the soil in the ground out in your garden that soil is much colder than the soil in your house it's got a different composition right the, the stuff you buy in the store that planting medium that you try to grow transplants in there, there's nothing like that in nature uh, little styrofoam things and shiny things <laughs> whatever that's made of uh, that's just not the same thing as what exists in your garden <clears throat> so some plants really do not like that 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 transition and of course they can recover from it but it really slows them down it's a different composition um, so uh, that's just another as another reason why it, it just seems to there's a huge advantage if you can make it work to get things direct seeded uh, some examples so uh, one thing I do in my garden uh, last year I started lettuce and spinach in uh, early March I actually had some spinach I even started at the end of February now it's it's uh, around March uh, Mar it's, it's like early March I, th I think I'm gonna put this up on March 2nd and I'm recording this uh, over the you know, couple days like February 28th March, March 1st sort of thing um, I still don't have anything planted out in my garden yet last year I had stuff planted out the last week of February just because that year it just felt right uh, this year it's been so unbelievably cold it just doesn't feel like there's any point uh, maybe next week I'll just I, I do this I do these sort of things by feel I'll get something going fairly soon in my garden but it is still it's just been freezing outside and we haven't had like four four days four consistent days of summer we just haven't had any sun at all uh, this winter this we're going into late winter but we just haven't had any sort of sun to warm up the ground so I, I just don't think it's even worth my while to put the energy into trying to get things to to start out there it's just been so uh, unbelievably bad but soon I will plant some stuff out uh, by this time last year I had some stuff in the ground and uh, uh, probably in the next week or so I'll put some I find lettuce and spinach the toughest things especially that uh, uh, Paris Island cost type variety of lettuce very tough um, and then a little bit later on maybe uh, I'm talking about under plastic now under a hoop house or in a cold frame that sort of thing uh, late March or early April you can get your uh, kale and chard and beets and I'm speaking to where I am and yes I'm in zone A but not every zone is the same so you, know, you have to play with these things and adjust them uh, accordingly but <coughs> so I'm sure there's places in the world where early April you can just direct seed kale and chard without even a dome but where I am, <laughs> uh, if you direct seed them without some sort of uh, microclimate, there in this particular location, not much really happens. Um, and then the things like squash and cucumbers and beans and tomatoes and stuff like that, uh, mid to late May, and uh, early uh, eggplants and peppers for where I am, early June. You adjust that forward or back to, but I mean this this sort of thing. There's a huge range of microclimates even within a province. Uh, the, you know where I, where I live in my province in Canada I could I could drive an hour from here and get different growing conditions um, because of the proximity to the Atlantic Ocean and, and things like that so uh, you got to adjust all don't don't take anything I'm saying here as a rule you got to adjust these things to where you are I'm just speaking in general principles um, the carrots and peas and parsnips and stuff like that I let them fend for themselves uh, I don't bother putting them under plastic uh, you know the peas grow too fast for plastic in it for a dome um, so you know you, you, as soon as the soil can be worked you put them in the ground and they come up and they come up I find you know your peas are the first thing like that that you get in your garden 
and then you as soon as your peas are done you start getting beans um, so th that sort of thing seems to work out just fine I don't worry about too much and also things like carrots and parsnips they, they really don't start to taste good until you're getting frost you know in November sort of thing so carrots and parsnips carrots are a thing I I harvest in late October November that sort of thing and parsnips I tend to harvest them in December because that's when they taste good um, so you know I time everything in my garden uh, in, in a way that makes sense right uh, and I, why would I want my parsnips to be ready in September they need a frost to increase their sweetness so I'm not gonna try to jumpstart them sort of thing I mean if you're trying to break some Guinness World Record with parsnips uh, sure jumpstart them and get them going a bit early or whatever but you know uh, it's just not my thing um, you can also I'll do you know using the plastic you can do two beds of the same thing same thing so you can have one bed that has two things that grows in a, in a given season so to give an example of that I had I had two beds side by side that I, I planted stuff in in early March so in one bed I planted spinach in the other bed I planted kale first or second week of March and they germinated and they grew and the spinach was all done by first or second week of July. It had bolted and it was no good anymore. So once the spinach was done, and, and as it was starting to be done, I started thinning the kale from the adjacent bed and moving some of that kale, because the kale was planted too, too close, right? I had to thin out the kale in the adjacent bed. So I took that kale and moved it into the bed where the spinach had been. So my spinach bed became a kale bed from the thinnings that I had taken from the adjacent kale bed. So I didn't have to do any, any more work, right? I just uh, You tend to overseed anyway when you're direct seeding because you don't know what kind of germination rate you're going to get. And then as you're thinning, if you want more of something, you just take the things you've thinned and put them somewhere near, nearby. Um, this is a, a picture from last April. Underneath these two beds, I think the one furthest from me, that, that's exactly what I was just referring to. So the one right next to me had kale in it, and the one uh, a bit to my right, the second one over to the right, had spinach growing in it in April. And the snow is not a big deal, but you do have to go out if you've got a hoop house or a dome or whatever. You do have to go out with a broom and, and get the snow off so the light can get through. But actually the snow is not such a bad thing because uh, you, you push the snow down around the sides and it kind of insulates the bed. So you think of snow as a cold thing, but if you can get it around the edge of your dome, it actually holds the heat in. Snow is an incredibly insulative thing. That's why uh, igloos and, and different kinds of uh, uh, survival structures are made of snow because it, it's mostly air. So it actually, if you can get heat inside, it holds the heat in. Uh, so uh, yeah, relax. It's just snow. <laughs> um, final thoughts. In terms of microclimates, I actually prefer the hoop house to the cold frame. I know a lot of people talk about cold frames. There's a lot of literature on it, but the, the hoop house, I find it's more versatile. Uh, the cold frame is a fixed structure. You can't move them around um, so that you can't work them into your rotation, your crop rotation. I like the hoop house because wherever the hoop is, I can put it somewhere else next year. So uh, you can work it in. But I don't want to hoop over a garden where I'm going to put the potatoes or carrots. There's certain things I just I don't care to start those things early. So I find these hoops and things like that, sort of um, mobile, modular things like that, where they're not particular, they're not fixed to a particular location. You can pick them up and put them wherever you want to put them. Uh, I like that approach much more. Um, they're also cheap, and uh, they get many options to build them. Uh, if you look a lot of my videos, I, I have different kinds of improvised uh, microclimates. I don't just use those hoop houses. There's all kinds of ways you can sort of slap that together. Uh, also, uh, variety matters. Faster growing varieties are, if you're in a northern climate with a short growing season, they're certainly preferable. Uh, some varieties are a lot tougher than others. They can take more cold, more frost, more intense uh, cold periods, uh, certain kinds of things. And to that effect, um, uh, Vessi Seeds, my sponsor, was kind enough to offer up some seeds for the uh, 
gardening group that I was presenting, giving this presentation to. And uh, these are two varieties that I grew last year, and I asked them to provide a bunch of seeds to give away to the to the uh, to the audience. Uh, this green forest lettuce, which is available at Vessi Seeds, and Avon spinach. These are two things I planted in like you know first week of March last year, and they germinated and they grew, and they were way far ahead of everything else. And they, even though we had all these crazy frosts, they took it, they survived. And uh, I had a really great yield, and I was really happy with them. So I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. Until next time, get out there, get at it. Have fun in your garden, and uh, get planting. Thanks for listening.